Hello everyone, good evening. Thanks a lot that you are here on a weekday. In America, if people are coming for weekdays, which means they are really passionate about something, either the host or the speaker, or maybe both, I don't know. <laughs> and thank you, Shankar, for uh, inviting me. Technology, the modern technology is very fascinating. It can do both the things. It can unite and divide both, as you see. Normally what you get to hear is that the social media is dividing people. Social media is creating false narratives. Yes, it's true partly. But it's also uniting a lot of people. Imagine you discovered me, found me on social media. And one day you just send me a message that, Vivekji, I've seen something, why don't you just come? I was here a few weeks ago in America. That time I had no time, I could come. But I promised him I would come. And we had been interacting. And I found him to be a very genuine person. I really passionate and emotional about the work which I am doing. We are on the same path. So thank you for inviting me. Bhavani, thanks a lot for feeding me home food. And <laughs> I don't know if you know, for the last few years I have been traveling non-stop. Non-stop when I say non-stop. I mean there have been times for six months where I have not even gone home. And with just three t-shirts and two shirts I am just traveling. Because whoever calls me I am going. I just, what I want to share with you, I'm nobody actually. I'm not an academician, I'm not an intellectual, uh, and I have no experience in this field. But I'm like, I don't know if you've heard that story. Um, it's a famous story of Panchatant. You know, there was this boatman, and he used to ferry people from one village to another on the river. You know, all of you are from India, you know how they do it. These poor people, no cloth on their uh, body just fairy people. So one day a very educated, intellectual, wise man, wise person came and with lots of books on astronomy and religion and philosophy and everything. And he sat on the boat and they started chatting. So he said, what do you do? I mean, you've spent all your life just ferrying people from here to there and you know nothing about this world. Look at me. I know about the universe, I know about life, I know about philosophy and politics. You should get educated. It's very important that you know about everything. So you have wasted your life. This is the life of an animal. And then slowly the boat was going and it got stuck in a current and it started drowning. So he asked him, do you know how to swim? He said, no, I spent all my life studying, I never got time to swim. He said, okay, read your astronomy, I am going. And he jumped and he swam. Uh, cross the river. So I am like that boy. I got stuck in a current. I am. So I got stuck in a current and that actually by some divine intervention it changed my life forever. And that is the story I want to share with you. I am a storyteller. I will just tell you my story. If you look at this this world, the entire history of this world, of humanity, is nothing but a war of narratives. Human beings, right from day one, the minute they found a stone, since then they've been fighting. Sometimes bloody wars, sometimes world wars, sometimes atomic bombs. And most of the time, they are busy in establishing their dominance. Who is right? What is this world all about? What is the truth? What is the reality? Is your reality my reality? And that's why you keep fighting. And it's got nothing to do with politics. You find in family also husband, wife, brother and sister, two friends. But that's human nature. But it gets dangerous when it is organized and it is funded with a sinister objective. There's no, no problem fighting about some issues. You want a, this economic policy, somebody wants a different economic policy, somebody loves capitalism, somebody wants socialism, and by debating and churning out ideas slowly over a period of time, you discover the middle path or the correct path and you follow that. Indian freedom movement, if you look at it, today we say it's glorified, we say, oh wow, we fought freedom movement. But if you deeply study the history of Indian independence movement, it was a war of narratives. It was a narrative war between people who really wanted to fight for India 
And then there were people on the other side, they were involved in a different kind of politics. Whoever won wrote the history. It's always the victor who writes the history. India has been stuck in this war of narratives for the last thousand years. And especially more so in the last few years. There was a time when we had world's biggest GDP. And it's now all the economists, all the research scholars agree on this point that when Babur came to India, at that time India had the highest GDP in the world. I'm sure you, some of you uh, have studied that. Anybody who's in economics would know that. Then what happened to a country, a nation, which used to travel all over the world, a nation, a civilization, which survived the first civilization in the world, first language in the world and the language so perfect that I was watching a presentation by Harvard professors recently they had come to Goa and they had put it on charts and everything that how Sanskrit is the world's most perfect language we came out with first text, we discovered zero we had astronomy, we had our own democracy, we had political system, we had social structures we created family, we figured out how to do agriculture and we figured out what's beyond this life and we kept giving birth to so many peaceful religions. We not just were contained with what we created, we also created lots of verticals of that. Hinduism, then Buddhism, then Jainism, then Sikhism. And within that so many sects. We created some great literature. Then what happened that today, despite being such a big force, I'll tell you later in this discourse why we are such a big force. That we are always struggling for our identity. We are always struggling to find our space under the sun. We are always struggling to find the dignity which we deserve. Why is it that suddenly in so many years things have started going wrong? I'll tell you why. I was very comfortable doing whatever I was doing living in a very mediocre capitalist world, earning money by whatever means, the way people do. I was making movies, it's a job for which anybody can give his left arm. You ask anybody in the world, hey, you want to be a <coughs> If you are an Indian, chances are 100 out of 100 you will say yes. And it's a great life. One Friday your life changes from middle class, you've got Mercedes, you've got big bungalows, you're working with stars, wherever you go. People don't care what you're made of, people don't know what is inside you, what's inside here. They just go by glamour and you live a very fake superficial life and you can live like that. That's a good option. It's a great option. But when I turned 50, I said, now what? And I found myself sucked into mediocrity. Mediocrity not because of creating mediocre products, but mediocrity because I was also doing exactly what everybody does. I was telling stories that people wanted to hear. It's very easy, I know why you are here today. I can tell you stories that you want to hear. And you will say, wow, great. And you can clap, take pictures and go back. But I said, I have lived all my life impressing others. Now it's time I'm going to live for myself. It's time for me to express myself and I am going to tell stories which I see with my own eyes, what I feel, what is my expression. But then you know Bollywood doesn't give chance to those kind of things. So I mentally resigned from Bollywood, actually resigned. And I started a new struggle in my life and I started teaching in some institutes. Thank God I have some background in management and advertising and marketing. So I was teaching in an institute called Indian School of Business in Hyderabad, which is one of the 10 best business schools in the world. And I, uh, I run a module called I Am Buddha for Global Leadership, which is basically Indian philosophy, Indian values, but I, I tell them in a very modern marketing jargon and how they can be useful to the world. And some students asked me, they said, sir, can you mentor us, you are a filmmaker, you want to make a small documentary on Nexism as part of our corporate social responsibility project. You understand, CSR. So I said, uh, who's going to fund it? 
They said, we are going to fund it ourselves. We are 10 students and we have got 20,000 rupees each. So we will get 2 lakh rupees and we will make some documentary. I said, you are going to be the future CEOs of the world and you are going to put in your own money. You have failed your exam right now. <laughs> <laughs> so go and raise some funds. I just said that and I left. And it was, I remember it was a Christmas, uh, it was 23rd December or something. And with my family, I uh, took my little kids, went to Jaipur. And I got a call from this excited student on the 30th or 31st. He said, sir, we have found funding. Come immediately to Hyderabad. So on 2nd or 3rd of January, I reached there. And they had written to all the ex alumni's and uh, ISB has some guardians, you know. So some people, some rich people, they become guardians of some students. So one of the guys said he runs a huge Phoenix enterprise, huge uh, multi-million dollar uh, corporate in Hyderabad called Phoenix. So he agreed to and he thought, oh, these boys went, they didn't know. There's a very famous story of IBM, you know, there's one boy uh, who created, innovated something. So the chairman, I don't know IBM, but it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a legendary story. So he said, you are so wonderful young boy. So ask me anything, whatever you want, take any position you want to uh, be. You can just name it and I'll give it to you. He said, make me the manager. Because that's the biggest authority he had dealt with. He could have asked to be the CEO of the company, but he, all he could dream was that. So these boys could dream all was a small amount of one and a half crores, which was even not 25% uh, of my own fees. Now here I got stuck. There was no way it was possible to make that. It was almost impossible for that money. Unless a lot of people come and do free stuff. And I was coming from a commercial filmmaking. No, there no free lunch. Nobody does anything free. I don't know how to approach anybody and say do something free for me. But I don't know why. I am a believer in Saraswati. There was some divine intervention. Something said, why did you quit? You didn't quit because you wanted a comfortable life. It's a challenge. Maybe God wants to test you out. You are a filmmaker. You know how to make films. And if somebody really wants to tell a story, it can be told, uh, money doesn't matter. And then the details are in the book, but then we did a lot of disruptive and very innovative kind of production and finally I met the dean and the dean of the institute had refused to give the campus even to three years Amir Khan's film and he told me with a lot of pride we don't give it for shooting you know we refuse to do, uh, give it to Amir Khan then he said what are you doing when I explained it to him I don't know what happened there was no logic I didn't persuade him I said this. he said hey, listen you can use the entire campus, we won't charge you anything, but make sure there's no noise because this is ISB and it's like a very prestigious institute. And somehow we managed to make that film. So when these boys came, they gave me a story. The story was that there's a corporate CEO, a lady CEO, and she had mining interest in Bastar. If you know, Bastar comes in Red Corridor. Red Corridor is an area which in 2010 and 11, was almost 40% of India. That's why in my movie there's a dialogue on public it says that 40% of India is going through civil war. So this 40% area was under armed insurgency for 50 years. So she goes there and there's some technical snag in her helicopter and she has to spend 4-5 days there and when she comes back, she says, these Nazarites or Mois, whatever you want to call them, are actually wonderful people. They are Messiahs of peace and they are working for downtrodden and her heart changes. I said, but these are the stories which are not true. If you see, like if you have seen a film called Heather, which says that army is bad and these uh, terrorist jihadis are good. This has been a problem with Bollywood. We have been telling stories which people want to hear pleasing stories. We have always glorified the gods. If you look at all the Indian movies, we have always glorified the gods. We have glorified smugglers. We have glorified all these corrupt people. We have glorified heroes who basically uh, stalk women, who spank women, who, can, who make fun of uh, handicapped people. You know, we always celebrate those kind of people. A mediocre society, mediocre leadership promote these kind of things. So when we did research and I put all the papers together, I realized that there is a very serious issue here. 
you will read one story that two students disappear in say Odisha. Then after a few days, you will find there's a story that 76 CRPF Jawans are killed in one single ambush, the biggest ambush in the history of humanity. Single ambush. Then you will hear that one professor somewhere is being questioned by CBI. Then after a few days you will uh, uh, hear that people are in jail who are celebrating the killing of 76 people. Then later sometime in Bengal there will be a news that in Jadapur University some students are celebrating or they have a, a, a major debate that Durga, Goddess Durga was actually a prostitute. People read these incidents as separate incidents and that's why they don't put dots together. And the people who are responsible for raising questions kept quiet, never raised questions. And when I started putting dots together, I discovered a very dreaded thing. I found there's a very big nexus between the intelligentsia, academia, and NGOs and the masses. How I figured out, because their target for last 50 years is going, so many nationals are killed every year. So say for assumption, they have 100,000 target. At that time the target was 100,000. Now after Modi government has come down dramatically. 100,000 people with guns are working. <coughs> if every year 1,000 people are getting killed, so over a period of time it should become less and less. But it keeps going every year, which means new young people are joining them. And all these new young people who join them are educated people, engineers and MAs and research scholars. Where are they coming from? Who is recruiting them? I said in no family, it's impossible that in any family in India, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, you hate India, you hate Hinduism, you whatever you want. But inside the family when you become mother and father, it is impossible for any parents to teach their children that listen, when you go to college, become Kanaya Kumar and raise uh, Bharat Tere Tukde Honge or Absar Guru Zindabad and Pakistan Zindabad. It's impossible. How is it that the minute you cross 12 and you go to college, you become anti-Hindu, anti-India? Somebody must be brainwashing. And we figured out that life in Madrasa, these five, six, eight-year-old children are being brainwashed to become suicide bombers. Similarly, Indian institutes, lots of professors are brainwashing these young boys and girls to become anti indian We researched further and further and further and beyond doubt we found proofs. And that's how we started making this movie. I said, thank you Saraswati, you have gifted me a very nice, noble cause. This is a good cause. Society will really be proud of me and everybody will be happy that we have done great service uh, to the nation. We have discovered truth. <coughs> but when we completed the movie, the same investors who were very proud of this movie when they saw it, they left. They said, sorry, we have business interests. We can't support such a far-fetched idea. So whatever money we have given you, we don't want it back. You do whatever, we are not we are going to give you the further commitment. The students who started the whole thing, they were so passionate about the national movement. When they saw the movie, after that date, till date, I have not seen their faces. I don't know where they have gone. One student met me recently, he said, Sir, we had to, you know, we were passing out, graduating, and we had campus interviews in Google and Microsoft and McKinsey and all that. We don't want to get stuck with a film like this. I couldn't figure out what's wrong with the film. I thought I am telling something which every Prime Minister has said on the floor of Parliament, which every Home Minister has said, that nationalism, I call it nationalism, Deliberately, because when you say Maoism, it sounds they have a political ideology, which is no, they have no ideology, they are just criminals, terrorists. And people who do not know, they are in top five terrorist organizations of the world, if you do not know. Uh, you know, it's not I'm saying that, that's what they say. Top five terror organizations after Taliban, uh, Muslim, uh, that brotherhood, IS, and Boko Haram, and after Boko Haram, they are the 
biggest step in self-regulation. But in India, nobody recognizes them and tells self-regulation. Except for government says here and there, police officers say here and there. Everybody says that all these people are under the Roy and all these messiahs of peace actually are working uh, for the benefit of downtown. It's very difficult to fight the narrative of compassion. It's very it's impossible to fight the narrative of humanity. And that's why you'll find in modern times, most of the thieves use this word very often, humanity and compassion, humanity and compassion. You know, for humanity, they use. If somebody is using this word very often, let me just warn you from personal experience, you have to get very cautious. So after that, this film got stuck for four or five years. I also gave a book, it's, we call it CAN, film got CAN means mission abolished. And there are some doctors here, so which means the patient, no hope now, ask the, uh, ask the family to pray to God, that's it. So we reached that stage. And I had no option, I had invested everything, my time, everything I was working and ultimately you have gone bread and butter and I went back to making another video on the biggest distribution house which has taken the film from me. And they said, I said, see the film. They said, there's no point seeing the film. You have made it, so what's the problem? We'll release it. And just few, one week before that, I said, actually see the film. See what it is about. They saw the film and then they cancelled the contract. The film got selected for Mami, which is like one of the best uh, film festivals in India gold category. Means top five films of India. Because the jury is independent of anything, they didn't care. And we are very social, like you have a big group here. Similarly, we are social and we have we had this thing every Sunday, all the directors, actors, and a lot of writers would come. And we, I used to run something called Foodie Buzzer Club. A lot of people will come and throughout the day they will eat, drink, discuss films and you know, politics and all kinds of things. After they saw the film in Bollywood, one by one, everybody started leaving and slowly that foodie was our club, which used to have 50, 60 people every single Sunday, they were just one or two people. And I was absolutely left alone. And let me tell you one thing, we, some very of the young, we think that heartbreak is the worst feeling you can have. Your girlfriend leaves you, you say there's nothing can be worse than that. But ideological rejection is the most painful feeling you cannot imagine what it's all about. Ideologically, if you are rejected by your community, the profession, you are left alone. Because heartbreak, you can bounce back, find another girl. But here they cut off your finances, you have no job. Nobody cares about you, you are just in your room, sitting alone. So I am paint, I went afternoon, monsoon. I was painting, it was dark in Bombay, it rains a lot, when it's monsoon it gets very dark, there's no sun, very dark. And I was so frustrated. I said, what do I do? I go back to my hometown. I go back to the village, start farming. What do I do? I mean, if I want to write columns, I want to write something. Nobody wants to give a chance. Everybody is saying, what have you made? It's such a far-fetched idea. This film, it doesn't happen. Because according to Hindu Sanskriti, they say, if the if God, parents and Guru, they are standing together, first you touch Guru's feet and then you touch Ishwar's and your parents' feet. That is the status of Guru. A lot of people told me, how can you say that professors are recruiters of these terrorists? But I was convinced because I had facts, figures and evidences. And when I was in that dark afternoon, totally broken in darkness when there is no future, I don't know from where again Saraswati it was divine intervention, some voice told me that just because you have shot this film on film camera, doesn't mean it's a film. You didn't come to Bombay because there was an advertisement saying wanted directors. No, you came out of your own free will. So what happened to your free will? And I said, yes, I forgot about the world. And I said, ultimately, it's a story. The purpose of this film was not to make money. The purpose was to tell people what is India's biggest threat. I said, okay, I take this film, I show to universities. Because a lot of universities have cinema department. So the biggest cinema department is in JNU and I wrote to the professor of uh, JNU, uh, Ira Bhaskar. And I said, this is the film I made and I want to show it in your department to students. And she said, no, you cannot because this film is not a mainstream item. 
I said, okay, maybe. But three days later, I saw them tweeting that they were showing a film called Alibaba. Now, Alibaba is a film. I work a lot for LGBT rights, so don't misunderstand me. I'm not against LGBT at all. But that film, the theme of the film was that there's a professor in Aligarh University who was uh, suspended or something happened with it. So the film was, was he suspended because he was homosexual? A typical kind of a narrative, you know. They want to create, he's a Muslim and all those kind of things. And I said that every single Prime Minister writes from Indira Gandhi, irrespective of whether you are from this party or that party, all the IGs of Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, West Bengal, all these people, all the home ministers, all the intelligence agencies, all the international intelligence agencies, including UNO and all, have been screaming for so many years that this indeed is India's biggest internal security threat. Then what is the reason that she saying it's not a mainstream narrative? And I figured out one very important fact that the concern of India, the concerns of Hindu civilization, the concerns of majority in India in a very dubious manner have always been treated as, treated as alternate land, never as mainstream land. It is my country, the thousands of years of civilization when all the civilizations are dead in the world, despite being such mighty civilizations which have conquered the entire world, who are emperors, despite all the money and wealth, all of them have perished. Only two civilizations survived in the world, in the history of the world as of today, Chinese and Indian. To show the Hindu civilization and the threat to Hindu civilization be the mainstream narrative. The deal was, what we figured out, that on the eastern side, we have communist countries. And that's why right from the independence, you see the entire northeast has been under the influence of insurgency. Only until the last three, four years, uh, after Modi government came, they did a lot of treaties and now it's a different uh, place. But up to 2014, not a day uh, you would hear that there is no killing happening or no terrorist attack was happening in that area. All these 50 years we have seen insurgency and killings of people in the Red Corridor. So from the, from the, uh, from the eastern side, the conglomerate of all the communist terror organizations have been sending funding Indian terror operations. And this news is everywhere. You see Singapore Terror um, Institute, or all that, you can, it's so easy. In Google, everything is available. And from the Western side, the Islamic terror funding was coming into India. And I said, it's not something I discovered. This is what a lot of scholars have been writing. The papers are there. All the information is available on Google. Anybody can go and pick it up that a very serious effort is being made and today it's at such a peak they want to create a very strong Islamic Dalit bloc. They want to break up a Dalit from Hindu uh, civilization. The minute they do that, Hindus become minority in India. And when you have a minority, you can never have a Hindu God. And then slowly it becomes, I don't know what shape they want to give it, but the idea is there. So, when we found that out, everybody opposed it. All the Barkhadats and Raji, Barkhadat invited me for a show for the first time over there and she asked me something. He said, what? I said, because of intellectual terrorism. He said, who are intellectual terrorists? I said, you are intellectual terrorists. It's available in uh, my channel, you can see. I said it on the face. And till date, they have never invited me even once. This is ideological isolation. This is ideological rejection. And I said in my country, I am talking about the safety of my country. I am not talking about caste issue. I am not saying don't like minority. I am not saying what to eat, what to wear. All I am saying is there is a threat to this country of breaking up. And I am so proud of my civilization. Only for the simple reason that despite everything, despite being looted, invaded, everything, 
we have survived. And how? Today we are forced to that. We survived. And we didn't become angry and aggressive. We did not pick up guns and started shooting people to say, no, no, listen to me. We still kept learning. We still kept educating ourselves. We stood up on our feet after independence. And wherever in the world we go, we share our knowledge and wisdom. We are good people. We are great people. That's what I believe. I did not say that you have to believe in me. But the entire ecosystem stood up again. Thank God, again, with the divine intervention, two things happened when I was struggling. One, that Kanahiya Kumar episode happened. I don't know if you know about it. In JNU, some students uh, took out a protest. In that protest, they demanded that India should be divided into many pieces. They said, Bharat te re They asked for Azadi. They asked for Azadi of Kashmir. They asked for Azadi of Bastar. They asked for Azadi of Manipur. They asked for Azadi of Tamil Nadu. They asked for Azadi of all the states of India. The students of India study in a university which is 100% sponsored and funded by the central government. And then they said, Tum jitne abzal maroge, har ghar se abzal niklega. Abzal Guru, if you remember, is was a dreaded one of the top terrorists of the world after Osama who bombed India Parliament. They said Hindustan, Murdabad, Pakistan, Zimbabwe. Who are these people? And for the first time, we, some people recognize the importance of my film, Buddha and Rabbit. And on one side, lot of people started saying that you have made a prophetic film. How did you know in 2010 what was going to happen in 2016? I said, listen, this has been happening for lots and many, many years. The only thing is you didn't know. Anybody from Rajasthan? Nobody. In Rajasthan, if you ever go, you will see when these women, they work day and night as labor, and they have small kids, so either they can work and do their job, or they can look after a small four month, five years, they have to uh, breastfeed them. So what they do is, in Rajasthan, they grow a lot of opium. So this lady, the mother, she takes little opium, very small quantity of opium, and she puts on her nipple before breastfeeding the child. So he, after milk, he goes up to sea. And slowly he becomes duller and duller and duller and does not disturb uh, the mother. Same thing happened with Indian masses. In very small doses, small doses, we started making our minds dull and ultimately most of the masses, especially this non-English speaking small town middle class boys and girls, they felt defeated. They said nothing is going to change in this country and people stopped protesting and they said let them do whatever they want to do. And we gave space to people who had an agenda to break in there. People who were funded beyond doubt. There are so many evidences and proofs. I mean, it's, they are on payrolls of these terror organizations. A lot of funding which is raised in America and UK and all that, that is, goes through NGOs. The only job of those NGOs is to start converting people and reduce Hindu majority. And it's nothing to do with religion. If tomorrow somebody does this thing with Christians or Muslims or Buddhists, that is also wrong. The second thing what happened was, a professor in Delhi University called Sai Baba, on a wheelchair, a handicapped professor, he was caught, and it wasn't a BJP call, it was a Congress call. He was caught, he was also plotting to break India, and from his house, some very important documents were found. Those documents are called strategic documents. And these are five documents. And the Marxists, these uh, Maoists and Nazis, they owned it. And then they on all the international uh, uh, counter-terror organizations and all these people, uh, everybody unanimously agreed that these are authentic documents. And they exactly are doing what is written in the documents. And I'll tell you next to it what's written in the documents. Objective. They say, what is the objective of this uh, movement? Objective is to take over the state of India, not BJP or Congress. Take over the state of India by 2025. Strategy. How will you do it? The strategy is by capturing the cities of India. 
How will you capture the cities of India? They say with armed revolution. Now how will you do armed revolution? You just cannot take arms and go to Delhi. You will be killed. We have air force, we have army. It's not so easy. So they say, create a civil war-like situation. You create constant chaos, conflict. And how do you create civil war? And civil war situation, people who do not know coming about communism, this has been like for hundreds of years since Marx. In communism they believe, and you will find some parallels here also in US. In communism they believe that in a civil war, if you create a civil war, then masses, the citizens, however educated or intelligent they are, they will always side up with the revolution. Historically speaking, that's what happened in uh, Egypt, that's what happened in uh, Syria, in so many places, wherever the revolution. And you also have to know the fact is that all revolutions in this world have failed. Not even one revolution has ever succeeded. So communism has failed. So they have a strategy that you capture different uh, sectors of a city. Labor. Okay? Now labor you capture so you can stop the motor of the city anytime. In India, if you know Chakka down, this one, that one. Second is intelligentsia. Because intelligentsia controls the narrative. So you create an anti-India narrative. Where the masses and people are so frustrated with that narrative, they are always people are in discussion and debate with each other, always saying this is right, that's wrong, and they are fighting with each other. So create that narrative. Like the caste narrative, Kashmir narrative. Uh, the cow narrative, intolerance narrative, those kind of things. Then academia, professors, teachers, because professors can recruit and students, feminism and all those things are common. And students, they say according to their document that if you capture the minds of students, you have got ready-made arms and ammunition in the city. And the most important was legal, the legal act. Now where do you get money for this? How do you get money? It's a big operation today. People are here to organize this. You need time, infrastructure, some money and all, you know, lots of things you require. So they started extorting people in Red Corridor. Now Red Corridor is all jungles and mines and, and uh, natural resources. So people who come to sell their produce over there, all the trucks which pass for local bazaar, they take 1000 rupees from each truck. Doctors, you know they are still in India, there are a lot of doctors who uh, work in villages. So the doctors who go in their uh, bike or motorcycle to small village, treat 3-4 three, three, patients in one day. So they take extort, the doctors take money from them. They take money from teachers, their salaries. They take money from so, uh, panchayat people. They take money from these little girls who come to sell tehua leaves and the jungle produce. How much? They, you won't believe it. This is a story nobody tells you. In Bastar, their staple diet is, uh, you know these red ants? So in these trees, if you go, you find them thousands of red ants, small, big red ants. So these little girls go and they collect all those red ants. They come home and their mothers make chutney on that. That's what they eat. And then they make jars of red ant uh, chutneys. That poverty. And when this little, then mother sell, sell the girls, when they come and sell this red uh, chutneys, three or four jars, collects two, three hundred rupees, they take fifty, sixty rupees from that little girl and all. And that's how they collect, extort money to the tune of eleven hundred crore rupees from Bastar alone. From Jharkhand under seven, eight hundred, nine hundred crores. And to the tune of these thousands of crores of rupees are raised every single year to create India in a mode of chaos, conflict and anarchy non-stop. And I was surprised nobody in India, all these journalists, the so-called journalists, the professors, the intellectuals, nobody has raised this question that overnight, who organizes these Dalit protests? Who organizes all these protests and chakka jams and deshbans and who are these people who come and destroy all the public property? Who are these people? Do you know how expensive it is to go to Supreme Court? Ask one of your relatives in India. When Salman Khan had uh, that issue, his father had said it cost like 30, 40, 50 lakh. And if you know, to go to Supreme Court, it's very expensive, impossible for any 
ordinary person in India to go to Supreme Court. That's why most of the people can't even go. And that's why you see the injustice, justice is not being done. So when, for Yakum men, and at 3 o'clock at night, when Supreme Court opens its doors and lots of lawyers went there, why nobody has questioned who's funding it? Somebody must have paid money. Nobody questioned it. I realized because the entire narrative is in control of those people. And the voice of this middle class, small town person who actually loves this country, his culture, his heritage, who wants to do something for it, has given up. Why? Because in India the problem is if you do not know English, you have no space in that central life. And I always done it. I'm a, I didn't know any English until I was 25 when I came to Delhi to study. When I came, I was again ideologically isolated. Average Indian boy and girl who is from a middle class family, non-English speaking, a decolonized kind of a mind who believes in his culture, eats his own food, follows tradition, doesn't question mom, why do you do puja and all those. A typical Indian uh, boy and girl has to waste at least 10 to 15 years of his life fighting English language and English mindset. And this is the reason we gave them space. Why nobody has questioned a country which has given a civilization, which has given some of the finest politi political thinkers of the world? Krishna. Who can be a better political thinker than him? Buddha. There was so much of chaos and conflict in the world at that time. So much of suffering. He came with a new theory and for that time it was political because Ashoka followed it. Gandhi. Ambedkar. You include never buy the problems. But despite so many great political thinkers, what is Mao doing in India? The man who killed 16 million people, 16 million innocent people, children, women. You, have, you are also, you are in India, your families are in India. Have you ever wondered why nobody asked this question? In America, if somebody forms a party called a Communist Party of Mao, what will happen? Imagine. Can you imagine? Is it possible here? The world's freest country. For 50 years, they have been killing. Kashmir is, everybody talks about Kashmir. Look at the statistics. In 70 years of insurgency in Kashmir, the total number of people who have been killed, or in Kargil war, the number of people killed, more number of people are killed every single year in Red Cross. Arundhati Roy and all these people have been giving lectures all over the world. But not even one, this non-English speaking person ever found voice. Because the minute he comes and wants to say something, somebody says, hey dude, what's up? What's the confidence as he We destroyed in a very organized manner, in a funded way, in a very strategic Western strategies, we have the voice of Indian common man. And that's when I said I'm going to fight for this, the cause of this man. Because I'm one of them. So to cut short, so when I started showing my movie, so in jail they refused, they said we won't show it. I had to give you this background about where I was coming from. I did not realize I was asked, seeking the permission from the person who's actually one of them. That's why she said no. Some boy who can't even speak Hindi properly, a very vulnerable boy, he said, Sir, I believe in you and I will fight even if I lose my uh, admission in the college. I want to show this film, I'll do something for it. I said, Do it. So he organized something and they gave permission to him. They booked an auditorium. Anupam Kher and I, we reached there to show the film. And when we reached there, he said, they have cancelled the permission. They are saying that only 50-60 people are committed to come and it's a 200-seater hall, so we can't give you the hall. Illogical. I got very frustrated, so I tweeted about it. And I told this boy, is it possible that we show it on the street as a protest? Because if you do not protest now, you will never get a chance. 
He said, sir, I can organize some uh, young boys and girls and I can send WhatsApp messages and all that. I said, okay, do it. And I tweeted and I don't know what happened. Anupam Khair and I, when we reached there, we expected some 50, 60 people. There were four and a half, five thousand boys and girls sitting over there. On the branches of the trees, on the rooftops, on top of the cars. And for the first time in the history of JNU, an absolutely leftist campus, there were chantings of one day Mark. For the first time in the history. And that's when I realized that so many people want to express themselves. They want to be heard. They want to say something, but nobody represents them. And I asked, why nobody represents them? And I was told, whoever tried to represent their voices got killed within two, three years. And it's true. You see how many uh, people get killed in Kerala, RSS people in West Bengal. I don't know if you are involved in Indian politics or not. And from that day on, I have been traveling non-stop. Even if five people are there, I go and tell them about this biggest danger of Hindu civilization. I went to IITs. Everywhere they opposed me. They cancelled last minute in IIT Madras. They, we, the students, see, I tell you how it works. First students go, they say, we want to show a film. They give it, the clerk sitting over there doesn't know anything. He gives the permission, they get a letter. They send me an email, yes sir, come. As I start going close, some students get to the leftist faculty gets to know about it. They then come in and last minute they cancel your auditorium. Then hundreds of students will come with black flags and all those kind of things. They'll oppose you, they won't let it happen. In law university in Hyderabad, they declared a holiday because of this film. Because all their students are close to Hyderabad. So when if there's a holiday, they live in Hyderabad and universities two hours away from them. So they go back to their families. The minute they bought the holiday, all of them leave. But I went on and on and on and on. Ultimately, when I reached Jadavpur University, and Jadavpur University, let me tell you, is a country inside India with its own constitution. If you look at the graffiti over there, it's only anti-India things and anti-goddesses things. If you shame, you will die of shame, I'm telling you. Even peaceful people like you will feel like picking up something and killing people. I'm sorry to use that word. If you see what they write about Durga and Saraswati and Lakshmi and all these things. It's, when I'm talking about this, it's an overwhelming emotion I, which captures me. And it's good that I saw that. That keeps me going on and on. And when I reached there, this taxi I was in, a poor man, a poor man's taxi. They saw me and they came with sticks, everything, they assaulted, broke the entire car. And I said, they're going to broke the poor guy, how will he live? I said, wait, I'm coming out. And then they physically assaulted me and broke my shoulder. And it's been two years I'm doing physiotherapy and still I can't take my hand about this. It hurts me so much. And now I've stopped physiotherapy two, three months ago. I said, I won't do it, let it keep hurting. As long as it's hurting, it reminds me that mission is not over. Then they tore apart the, uh, the screen. So I called these boys, I said, you live in hostel? Yes, yes. I said, you have a white bed sheet. They said, sir, it's not very white, you know. We are bachelors, we could change it. I said, go run and get it, whatever you have. They brought it. And you know, these nets with Loeka, that, that. So I tied it myself. You can see on Google, all the pictures are there. All the press covered it. Then all of them came after me to destroy me. Nobody saw the film. Film was not released. They started writing Huffington Post. They said this film does not deserve any star. They didn't give any star. What kind of critic gives no star? Give quarter star, half star, something. Something is worthy of evaluation or not? They said no, it doesn't deserve. Which means this voice should not be heard. I said, why these top people, Rajdeep Sardesai and Barkha Dutz and all these intellectuals are after my life, why? Just because I'm saying that the India's biggest internal security threat comes from these Maxwells. What's wrong with that? <coughs> but this constant thing started happening. I had no work. If you uh, notice my journey in films, I made some very big multi-star films, very big budgeted films. And for last 
two three years. I have not. I just finished a film on Lal Bahadur Shastri's uh, death called The Tashkent Files. But that also how I raise money and the story for us some other time. In Bollywood they isolated me. In media they isolated me. Everywhere they isolated me. So I said I don't care about them. I'll walk alone. And since then, then I uh, wrote this book, Urban Axles. A gentleman in uh, Hyderabad asked me to put my resistance and all those things in a book form. When I, I thought I'll finish the book in 15, 20 days, it's a big deal, it's about my experiences. But when I started writing, I said, no, it has to be an honest book. I said, this book has to be about all that middle class, common citizen of India who have suffered because they were not, their parents were not part of Congress's corrupt, uh, the, they were not beneficiaries of uh, Congress's corruption. All those people whose parents have sacrificed and struggled hard so that their children can become something. People who are actually taking the light of India all over the world and making India proud. I am going to just write honestly for them. And for two years I felt, every single penny I had, I put into this. And I wrote this book. This book is not my book anymore. These are the stories of every single Indian. When you read, you'll understand. And when we sent it to publishers in India, all the multinational publishers, everybody refused to print it. Every single publisher refused, without exception. They said, Vivek might be a good filmmaker, but nobody is interested in a story called Urban Access. This is a far-fetched idea. Then we formed our own NGOs. We said, we will do it. I am so possessed with this uh, idea of fighting them, these people. We said, we will do it. When the book came out, at that time, Shashi Tharoor's film, uh, book, Why I Am a Hindu, was number one bestseller. Ravish Kumar's book was at number two. In non-fiction, if you understand non-fiction books, take almost one year, two years to go into a reprint. If you sell 10, 15 thousand copies in a year, it's a very big number. You are very, you're doing very well. When this book came out, within three days, this became number one bestseller. Within a week's time, it was globally in top 50 books. And in 10 days, it went for second reprint. Today I have just 10, 12, 14 books, which I also got very, very difficult. Even I don't get it. Comes in the market, it goes up. And we said, what is the reason? What is happening? You won't understand that the voice of the common man, a common Indian, his identity, nobody has spoken about it. We have been told lies throughout. And the lies before I put three, four things I just want to address. You must have realized that they started saying that India is an intolerant country. You must have heard about it. How many, everybody knows about it. Let's talk about intolerance. How many narratives are being created? I have a lot of American friends, they always tell me, but India doesn't tolerate. Let's start from tolerance, political tolerance. India has the maximum number of political parties. Anybody can form a party on any issue, whatever you want. You want to start a political party after your uncle? You can. Your child? You can. India is the only democracy in the entire world which has political parties based on Marxist philosophy, on Stalin, on Lenin, on Mao, name any other democracy which has. Can America do that? Can you form a party, you can say Communist Party of uh, Stalin? Can you make a party on, on uh, Mao? Not only that, we have one of the topmost politicians in India who might be a contender of Prime Ministership in 10 15 years. His name is Stalin. Can you ever imagine in the world's freest country? People who say it is the greatest democracy in the world, do you, can you, in your worst nightmare, can you imagine somebody contesting for American president election called Stalin? We do it. And nobody minds. Because we are Hindu civilization, we are a liberal, inclusive civilization. We say, okay, you want to believe in that, believe in it, what's the problem? You want to believe in that God, believe in that God. 
We have no political interference. Yes, the quality of politics can be bad. You can question the quality of politics. But you cannot question the principle of political uh, freedom in India. Let's talk about religious freedom. That's the second accusation against us. Tell me which other civilization or country has given birth to four most peaceful religions in the world? Besides us. We talk about diversity in the Western world. Yes, you have people living from Indian community, Chinese community. You have all over the world people come and live here. How much you interact with them? Chinese people live in their own world, Indians live in their own world. There is no interaction. There is no interaction between Americans between themselves. And you will find very often here, the middle class interacts only with middle class. Rich people interact with only rich people and poor interact only with poor people. In India, you can't spend even one day without interacting with a Muslim guy or a Sikh guy or a Jain guy. You won't even know who's who, poor, middle class, lower class, the slum dweller. You will have some interaction, you'll talk to them. When the maid servant comes to your house, most of the housewives keep talking to them. That's how the whole society knows what is happening where and what one is going through. Education. Most of the world has only two kinds of education systems, public and private. India, you want to go to a madrasa, go. You want to have a Vedic education, go. You don't want to have education, don't have it. You want to go to central school, go to government central school. You want to go to convent school and pray, hey Jesus Mary, you can do that. There are Buddhist schools. You can get educated in whichever way you want to. It's a greatness of the society which nobody is talking about. Again, you can question the quality of education, but you can't question the principle of education. And the religious freedom you hear a lot about in the US, this was because Martin Luther, not Martin Luther Jr., but Martin Luther who uh, protested for Protestants, then they ultimately, the Catholic, they said, okay, let's include it, let's say we have religious freedom. That religious freedom is not for Hindus or Muslims or other, other people. That religious freedom is for Christians between themselves. And again, the lie which has been created by Indian media and all these Washington Posts and New York Times, when Modi's visa was rejected, why was it rejected, tell me? Anybody knows? Gujarat. What Gujarat? Gujarat. Look at this. You guys are one of the most educated, aware people. You live here in the US, the most aware people. There were uh, some uh, politicians from the Congress party who had returned to the US government. No, the fact. These are all narratives. Fact. Because Modi passed, Modi passed a law. Achha, if it was Godra, Godra happened which year 2002? Yes. When was it being rejected? It was cancelled which year? 2011 or something like that, right? Or later, maybe. before 14, two, three years before 2014. Because he passed a law against conversion. Then they said he would have religious freedom and cancel his visa. If 2002 was so important to them, they should have cancelled 2003, 2004, 2005. You don't cancel somebody's visa retrospectively. That way we should cancel all British uh, visas to India saying you, you looted us, so we are not giving you. That's not that's not This is all fake. So this intolerant debate is absolutely fake. Second thing they try to embarrass us all over the world is this beef controversy. This beef controversy, I just want to tell you, I come from a very small village. My entire family is not there. I'm the only surviving member in the first blood. So in my village, my parents come from a village with no electricity, no drinking water, no railway line and all that. So I asked all some relatives, I said, oh, you know, I don't care about whatever land, but there were some cattle. Where is that gone? And then, you know who's looking after the cattle in my village? The Jula, the weaver community. And weavers are Muslims. It's an absolutely false narrative which has been created. It appears as if all Muslims in India eat beef and all Hindus don't want them. It's wrong. If you meet Muslims in UP, Bihar, they are like us, they don't eat because culturally they are us. Hindu civilization does not mean only Hindus, all Muslims, Christians, everybody is part of it. 
they follow the same culture and that is why you will find all musicians of India, mostly they are all Bismillah Khan, Akbar Ali Khan and Zakir Hussain and everybody, they are all Muslim people practicing staunch Muslims. But when they start their performances, they start with Saraswati Bandana. And you see Bollywood, all the Hindu heroes, Vijay and Rohan and Rahul and all that, they are singing songs of Khuda, Allah, Rab and... Isn't it? Why don't we look at the greatness of this country? Where does it happen? In Hollywood movies, have you ever seen any white people singing black songs? <laughs> have you ever seen any Jew singing Christian songs? Hymns? No. We are the only society which is doing in the world and I'm surprised what has happened to Indians, educated Indians, that nobody is raising this, these things in front of the world. Your heart should be filled with proud. There is no other society which allows this. The third thing, so this cow would be thing, I was invited by India today for a conclave in Calcutta. If I am taking too long, please let me know. I will stop whenever you don't like it. But I thought it's important you know the truth because I don't know if anybody will come soon and tell you the truth. And if you think logically I am wrong, tell Now, I was invited by Rajdi Rose to India to get conclave in Calcutta. And there was a panel discussion, before my panel discussion, on the diversity of food in India. Now this is one subject you can talk for years and years because within one state you will find so much of diversity. If you go to UP, curry for example, we can keep discussing because in India you make curry in hundred different ways. Every hundred kilometers it changes. Sambar, you go to South India. I have so many South Indian friends. Everybody says no, our sambar is better because everybody is making it different. <laughs> Recently there was a very big argument between uh, uh, Odisha and West Bengal that who has, who Gulab Jamun belongs to who. <laughs> then they found out that their Gulab, their Russia Gula, sorry, their Russia Gula is different from their Russia The way we dress up, the costumes keep changing. But Mr. Rajiv Sardesai was the anchor. You know Rajiv Sardesai? He was the anchor. Now there is this man sitting. He starts talking about Mysore Park. You know, Mysore Park is a yes. sweet place. He said, no, but tell me what about beef? The other guy said, you know my Roshogula, what about beef? Everybody is trying to talk about the food and he's saying, what about beef? <laughs> and it's a clever strategy. Because slowly everybody's mind, in one hour session, starts thinking about beef. And the minute the keyword beef comes, you go with the headlines, and you think there is a problem with beef? You don't know the facts. You have no idea what is happening. But you go out thinking, yes, maybe there is a problem with beef. You feel guilty about it. And somebody argues, no, no, in your country there is no freedom for food. You have no argument. So when I went there, I said, listen, I just want to ask you two questions. Number one, how many of you can go back tonight? There are a thousand people. I said, how many of you can go back tonight and ask your mothers to cook beef in the kitchen? You won't believe it, just four or five minutes came up. I said, you can't influence your mother. Why do you want to change the entire world first? To ask your mother to cook beef and then let's talk beef. When nobody eats beef in India, who are we debating with? Who are we fighting with? In America, they don't allow to eat horse meat, do they? Because they used to move on horses, so horses are important to them. So therefore in Texas I was there yesterday, they said, you, oh, you can't kill horse, they will kill you. In England, you can't do, the, you can't kill swan, because swan is the royal bird. In Australia, you can't kill kangaroos. Every society has something that depends on animals, they don't allow that killings. And the second question I asked, and which I want to ask you guys, have you ever met anybody who has been stopped from eating what he wants to eat in India? I have not met. If you know anybody, please tell me. And I challenged them, I said, not you. Ask any friend of directly, indirectly, if you know of anybody on this earth who says in India I was stopped from eating what I want to eat, I will go with my own money, go there and find out whether it's true or not. Nobody has an answer. The same people who write headlines every single day had no answer. So this is all over us. Third thing that they make you feel embarrassed about is the caste issue. 
Isn't it? Isn't it? India has a major caste problem. It is given to understand that upper caste people are oppressing all these people. The Brahmins are the real villains and uh, the Nazis of the world. Wherever I go, I go to so many universities. The students feel embarrassed, sir. You know, all everything is fine, but Hindu, the minute we say Hindu, they say caste and we have to shut up. So I am telling you something today which nobody tells you. Because I am not paid by anybody, so I can afford to say that. When India got independence in 1947, if the oppression was at 100, let's say, if the index was 100, after 70 years, where do you think it is today? At what level? Any guess? Hmm? Yeah, any other, whatever you want to say, doesn't matter. What is your perception? I'm not saying it's Okay, so right. So 20, 20, 30 you are saying, mostly where I go, it ranges people's perception is that's come down to 15 to 30. You are perfectly on the universal. Everywhere you, I go, people respond. Now you tell me, which other society in the world in 70 years has been able to do this kind of social change? And don't want to get into facts uh, because that's a long chapter. I have a lot of statistics with me. This caste re-engineering in India is the most successful social re-engineering in the history of this world. Jews and Christians have not been able to settle their issue after 1945. Black and whites have not been able to uh, settle their issues. Muslims and Christians have not been able to settle their issues. But in India today, the president is from lower caste, prime minister is from lower caste, so many chief justices and justices and supreme courts and high courts are from lower caste. 40 to 50 percent collectors who actually control at the district level are from lower caste. Most of the law enforcing energy, uh, agencies are, are the people are from lower caste. Professors, policy makers, you name it. ISRO, the science, rocket science. Any field you see, microbiology, any you name it, you will find nobody cares about it. There is no place. When you give a job, you don't care whether he's Dalit or he's what. It used to happen a long time ago. Nobody stops you in entering a hotel or a restaurant because you are a Dalit. Nobody stops you entering a temple because you are a Dalit. No Brahmin is going out on the street and saying, Hey, I am a Brahmin, so therefore I am superior. In fact, today if somebody should do this research, one of you should sponsor it, this research to find out maybe there are more poor upper caste people. That this is also reality. Why doesn't anybody talk about this landless, poor uh, Brahmin farmer? who doesn't have penny to eat two times meal, that discrimination is okay. So we have been able to do a great service in social re-engineering. Yes, we have oppressed. Yes, we are guilty of that. But I should not suffer because of this. There is no regressive uh, uh, justice system. Why should I suffer because my forefathers did something? Today's India is trying to build a new society. Now last but not the least, another thing which is against Hindu civilization is women. All over the world if they want to embarrass us, they want to shut us up, they say your women are not empowered. Your society does not allow women to be empowered. I spoke about it yesterday, I speak about it everywhere in the world and this is my counter argument to feminism movement. I say Indians have been traveling, we were the first travelers almost along with Chinese and all, we started traveling all over the world. And we have been traveling for thousands and thousands of years. And whenever we travel, we take the light of wisdom and knowledge with us. When Buddha started traveling, the entire Eastern world became Buddhist. When we started traveling in early 40s and 50s and 60s, you see our contribution to medical science. When our engineers started traveling, you see NASA, most of the people I uh, went there the last time, most of them were Indians. In IIT, when we started traveling, you see today we have like, dominated the entire world. Teaching, profession, nursing, including peacekeeping forces, 
we have the largest number of peacekeeping forces in the world. UN, which UN organizes. So wherever we travel, without exception, everywhere in the world, people say the impression about Indians are that they are good people. Always helpful, sharing knowledge, never conflict with the society, never in crime, never in terrorism. Indian people, you won't find that they pickpockets or they have mugged somebody, never in these kind of things. Italian people, they say there is mafia, yes, Russian mafia, French people, they are very arrogant, not non-inclusive, British people, absolutely non-inclusive. Every society has some issues or the other. Australian, they say, oh, they are alcoholics, they drink a lot of alcohol. Indians, they don't say they are alcoholics. They say these people contribute to the society. They contribute to the capital, the wealth of the society, to the knowledge of the society. Always helpful, smiling, come home, come home, have dinner, stay with us, come on, come on, come on, you know. And you go there and you find that somebody is cooking. So everybody appreciates that. Above all, one quality Indians have which no other society. You can trust in this. I travel a lot all over the world, and not just America, and most of the world, you will find the biggest tragedy today is that people don't trust each other. In America, white people don't trust white people, but they trust them, Indian people. What else do you expect from humanity? What can be a better example of humanity? So when Elon Musk makes a battery-driven uh, car, when he makes electric cars, or a driverless car, or when Steve Jobs makes Apple, we say what a contribution to the society and to the world, which it is, undoubtedly. The entire world celebrates them. Time Magazine says Man of the Year, Economists say Man of the Year. In all the business schools, corporate world, they give examples, say, look, Elon Musk, he has done that. So when you create a product which really helps the humanity, you celebrate it. My question is this. Who has been manufacturing these people? All these great Indian human beings who go and people can trust them. Who has been making them? Our mothers. The Indian women. Don't you think she should be celebrated? Don't you think she's empowered? And I'll tell you why she's empowered. For a minute, just think about your own mothers. Now think about her sacrifice. Think what she has gone through. She never did anything for herself. Look at her sari, the kind of sari she has been wearing. For years and years she kept wearing. She had two saris which she wears for some wedding and all. She is the first to get up, last to sleep. She is working day and night. She cooks food for children. She cooks food for the husband. She cooks food for everybody in the joint families. She cooks food for any guest you can bring any time and say, I've got four friends and she'll do it. She is the inventory manager, she is the finance manager, she is the value addition manager, she is the HRD manager. She does every god and thing just to create good human beings. How? By sacrificing. She doesn't do anything for herself. And if you look at a typical Indian mother, she doesn't buy black milk, she doesn't buy Mac uh, products. She has sacrificed everything, her happiness. She doesn't care about traveling. And when you have children, she comes back again to raise those children. Do you think she, that woman is not empowered? Now ask any woman in the Western world, half of the responsibilities ask her to do it, she'll collapse instantly, trust me. Then her family will collapse and the entire society will collapse. So we have to understand one thing, our biggest wealth and heritage is our family system and our women, our mothers. And at any cost we have to protect them and we have to nurture them. And we have to change the narrative. We have to find out the respect she deserves. We have to tell the story of sacrifice of our parents of the society. We are not just people who were, uh, who were born in some elite society with lots of resources where everything was available to us. We had nothing. We are coming from scarcity. We are born in bicycles that all these people have walked miles and miles from villages to become engineers and doctors. They have sacrificed their entire youth to become somebody. They didn't do what other work people were doing in the Western world. We have sacrificed so much and that's why we have been able to share this wealth and knowledge all over the world. And this is the reason why Hindu civilization has survived. Despite all the attacks and assaults and the lootings and invasions, we have survived. 
tell me his story is more successful. The person who was destroyed completely and stood up again and risen and today we are the second largest food grain producers. We are the fifth largest economy in the world. We are not, we are the large, we are the fastest growing economy. 8.2% or something like that. Just to tell you the recent figures, in steel production we are number two. We have left now Japan behind. We are number two in textile manufacturing, we have left Italy behind. We are number three in electricity production in the world, we have left Russia behind. We are number four in automobile production in the world. Can you number three? A country like India to be the fourth largest producer of automobiles. You know who we have left behind? Germany. We are number two in mobile production after China and very soon in the next few months you will find the minute Apple's largest uh, production out starts producing in Hyderabad will be the largest producer of mobile phones in the world. And we are number one in sugar production and lots of things and there are lots of strategies we can talk about. We have sent the cheapest ISRO uh, mission, to the, uh, mission on the Mars because we know how to sacrifice. We are a great success story. Instead of being proud of our civilization, of our values, we are constantly made to feel small. By the people who are funded by the vested interest to break the society, break the Hindu community. And I said, I have to stand up and fight this. And today when I stand here, I have nothing, believe you me, I have no money in my pocket. There are so many death threats on me. Do you, you don't know, I don't talk much about it, but today I am telling you because somebody closed this thing. When I go back, there are more than 50 organizers sitting to cut me into pieces. And that is the reason nobody talks. Nobody talks because of violence, but somebody has to stand up and do it. And here, before I end, I just want to tell you three things. We all are guilty of this. All of us are responsible for where we are today. And if we have to go forward, and if we want the world to say, yes, we are great people, three things you have to remember. Our three biggest strengths of our society we have abandoned. Number one, sacrifice. Sacrifice has been the strength of our civilization. When we were looted, when we were invaded, Imagine the kind of sacrifice this society has done to find their independence back without killing anyone. Second thing, Saraswati. This I have a major complaint. Everybody now is worshipping Lakshmi and Durga. We have abandoned Saraswati. The reason we have Lakshmi is because of Saraswati. <coughs> when was the last time you guys gifted books to some young boy and girl? Raise your hand. Very few, I'll tell you once. How will the new generation understand who we are? So this Diwali, you must promise yourself, it costs nothing. Just a button on Amazon. And these are the very cheap books. You give to your children, and not to your children, but to their friends, to American friends. What does it take? Diwali says it's a great day for us and here's books we are going to give to. Nobody says no to books. Give Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, Panjshtant, whatever you want. Give Urban Nexus, give any books. Start giving books. <coughs> and see the power I am telling you, your life, the lives of people around you, it's a slow process. In four or five years, on every birthday, every Indian uh, festival, every important occasion, on 4th of July, Give books of America, doesn't matter. But give books, physical book. When you hold a physical book, at some time in your life, you go back to it. And the third thing is, we have abandoned spirituality. And by spirituality, I do not mean closing your eyes and meditating the way best it's being marketed in the West. That is not our spirituality. Meditation is just a tool. Spirituality is to discover the truth. Spirituality is practice to find the truth. And you find the truth with inner dialogue. 
inner dialogue, what you see outside and what is internal, a constant, you have to cultivate a habit of constant dialogue. Hum Shastak, if you have heard about it, why all these Vedas and Upanishads and all these things were written? So that you know different perspectives. Why do we have millions of gods? So that they are always interacting with each other. If you look at it, all the gods of Hinduism, they are always interacting with each other. They are all connected in some way or the other with each other. They are all having a constant dialogue with each other. They are not independent of each other. Similarly, we are not independent of the universe. We are part of this big scheme of things and that's why Hinduism, the first mantra is Tattva Masi, you are that. You are God. You are atom is God and God is atom. Whole is small, small is whole, that entire philosophy. That's what we are. That's what people have to understand. And once we start doing it, once I started doing it, it changed my life. It changed so many other lives. And you'll be happy to know that just few days after my book came, since then, at least 10 to 15 urban nexus have been arrested. Everybody said that this is a fake theory and today all over the world they have accepted it as a confirmed political ideology. Urban Nexel has become a legitimate term and believe you me, you are here, I am here, in few years in America will start using this term. Because this term has come from truth, it hasn't come from a political agenda. So people have been arrested, the surrender rate has gone to 200%. And the 40% geographical area now has been reduced to some 2029 20, exact figure. I don't know. The government of India just released the figure only to 2029 20, districts. And very soon, if I can build an army which I'm doing going university to university, more students come and start talking about it, more debates start happening. Every media for the last one month has been debating only other things. The Home Minister invited me, he said the Prime Minister invited me, he said, come and we were discussing. Everybody has understood that there is a huge conspiracy going on and is very well funded to break and stop the success story of Hindu civilization. I am doing my job, now it's up to you. I am not saying you have to be a warrior like me. I am not saying you become a crusader. You do exactly what you are doing in your life. But just do one thing. If you think that yes, we must take this torch forward, Share this knowledge with your children. Share this knowledge with your friends. Over a drink when you sit or for dinner. Tell them about the greatness of our civilization. The Jews, when they are a Holocaust, the whole world gives them money and they say, Oh my God! As if this was the only tragedy of the world. Because they kept talking about it. They kept people reminding people about it. We found independence, we said, okay. Somebody broke millions of all the temples, we said, okay. Now they are breaking our, breaking us apart. Don't say okay this time. Use technology, go on social media, write about it, do these kind of events whenever you can get it. It costs nothing. What does it cost? Just you have to get one person. I will help you connect with me. There are lots and lots of people who are working for this God. Connect with them. But please make this little contribution. Trust me, there is no feeling better in this world than gratitude. I am going through that and I am sharing with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any questions.